If you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be starting in verse 3. And as you turn there, I hope you would agree with me that we live in an uncertain world. This is a world full of uncertainty, confusion, and disappointment at times. We may wake up some morning and gas may be $15 or it may be $2. The weatherman may say it's going to be 100 and it ends up snowing. <laughs> a politician may promise this but deliver something else. We live in an uncertain world where we can't always believe what we are told. That something happened to Maggie and I recently with the airline industry. And if you've flown this year, you know there may not be anything more unreliable in our world right now than the airline industry. Maggie and I haven't flown for many years, but this year we've had several opportunities to fly to a couple of different places. Earlier this year, we were flying to uh, Michigan and we ended up getting stuck in the Atlanta airport for about 17 hours. We now consider it as one of the places that we lived. Um, but what happened was we flew out of, of Eisenhower very early in the morning. I think our plane left at like 6 a.m. And so we land in Atlanta. You turn your phone back on because if you're a good uh, uh, passenger, you turn it off when you're in the air. Um, and then uh, you land and your phone comes on. And then the first notification you get is your flight has been canceled. Okay, wish I would have known that before we got up at 4.30 to get to the airport. Um, but anyway, so we get there, we go straight to the customer service desk, we tell them what happened, they empathize to a degree, and they say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to book you a hotel in case you get stuck overnight, but we're going to put you on standby for these next couple flights that should get you there just a little bit later. I'm like, okay, that sounds, that sounds great. So we go, we, we get in the standby line, we miss it. We miss it. And so we're like, okay, well, we're on standby for the next guy. We go to the next gate. I'm talking to the ticketing agent, the guy there. He said, I quote, if I were a gambling man, you're getting on this next flight. We didn't get on the flight. So we then, we, we, this goes on and on for 17 hours to where we're about ready to cut our losses. So we go back to the customer service desk and say, hey, look, we're, it looks like we're not going to get out of here today. Y'all told us that we could have a hotel. We'd like to go ahead and get the hotel and just go relax. You can't have a hotel. I almost lost it. I, I almost lost it. So it's this whole day of promises and back talking and things being told that never really followed through. We eventually, what ended up happening is we, we were trying to get to Grand Rapids, but they put us on a flight to Detroit and we rented a car about... Uh, about midnight, and then we drove three hours across. I'll tell you what, Michigans, they don't know what driving is because they're like, That's, you're driving all the way across the state. And I'm like, I'm from Texas. It takes 13 hours to get from where I live to El Paso. I'll be fine. And so it only took two and a half to get from Detroit to Grand Rapids. But anyway, we live in uncertain times. But thankfully, it's not that way with God. With our God and our Savior, we can know a hundred percent that when he says something or when he says he's going to do something that we can rely on that a hundred percent and so what we're going to see as we get into this first chapter of philippians we are going to see how we as believers can have assurance of our salvation and assurance that God will not leave us the way he found us, but he will grow us and change us and mold us into who he wants us to be. So let's look at Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Paul writes this, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it is right for me to feel this way about you, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel." 
For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we walk through this passage this morning, that we would be reminded of the confidence that we can have in you. That we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we belong to you and that we can take to the bank. Lord, I pray that that we would hear the words of your scripture this morning and we would be changed and we would be transformed so that we may bring more glory to you through our daily lives. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, as we get into this, we're going to see that this is really a prayer. Paul is praying for the Philippian church as the introduction of this letter. And now what we tend to do... I'm going to say we, I mean I, what I tend to do when I crack open my Bible and I start reading, especially a letter of Paul, I can tend to glaze over the beginning because he gets really wordy and it's really just an introduction. And who reads the introduction to anything? You should read the introduction. But there is some really important things in here. And in this prayer for the Philippian church, I believe that we can learn and grow and see what he has to do. So Paul begins his prayer with thanksgiving and joy. Verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. What he's saying is, every time I pray for you, I am thankful. I am thankful. And then he doesn't stop there. He also says that every time I pray for you, I am filled with joy. And now what we may see that and see that's great. What can I learn from this? Well, what we can learn from this is we can see how Paul prays for other churches and for other believers. And we can ask ourselves, am I praying for other churches and other believers in the same way? An example is we just recently, as a church, we have adopted an unreached, unengaged people group. And if you don't know what that means, or if you weren't here that day and you have no idea what I'm talking about, basically what that means is we have partnered with the International Mission Board, which is what we as Southern Baptists do the primary, if not all, of our overseas missions work through, and they have different labels for different groups. The group that we have chosen to adopt is an unreached, unengaged people group. And simply what that means is that this group has never heard the name of Jesus Christ. It's not like a small, it's not like a group that has been engaged and they've heard and some people believe. No, this group has never heard the name of Jesus. And there is a missionary team in Northern India right now trying to reach them and trying to change that. And part of our partnership is to pray for them. And now oftentimes we pray for them. We say, we pray for the success of the work. We pray that the gospel can be shared. But many times, maybe what's missing from our prayer is, God, we are so thankful that you have raised this team up and that they're out there. And it fills my heart with joy to know that there are believers out there furthering the cause do we pray for other believers with joy and thanksgiving maybe another question that we may need to ask is are we the type of believer and christian and that when people pray for us that they're thankful and filled with joy or are we filling their hearts with heartache when they lift us up That's all for free. That's all for free. So we see that Paul begins his prayer for the Philippian church with thanksgiving 
and joy. But then he tells us why he has such thanksgiving and joy, and it is because of the assurance, the assurance that he has of their salvation and that they should share with him. And as Paul unpacks his assurance for them, he does so in two different ways. He tells them, I have a human level of assurance, but greater than that, I have a divine level of assurance of your salvation. Verse 5, we begin to see Paul unpack his human evidence for their assurance. He says in verse 5, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So what Paul is saying is, when I was in Philippi, and I shared the gospel with you, you received it, you were transformed with it, and you have been engaging in the good work since then until now. I have observed your faithfulness, and it has given me joy and thanksgiving. So basically Paul is saying your faithfulness to the things of God have given me confidence that you are truly believers. And this is a theme that we see constantly throughout the New Testament. We see the, the, the Apostle John. He writes about this in several different places. In John 14, he says that if you love God, you will obey and keep his commandments with this idea of ongoing faithfulness to the things of God. He continues on in John 15 where he says, and this is how my father will be brought much glory through the fruitfulness of your life. He even would repeat himself in 1 John where he says that if we claim to have fellowship with God, yet we walk in darkness, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. All this to say, this is a litmus test. We know what a litmus test is. If you remember from, I believe, middle, middle school science, it's a, it's a little piece of paper that you dip into a, a, a liquid and it tells you if it's an acid or a base. If I got that wrong, science teachers, you can come yell at me afterwards. Um, but it tells you what it is. And so what Paul is saying, I have observed your actions, I have dipped the test in it, and it has shown me that you are faithfulness. So through your actions, I can make an assumption that you are truly saved. So Paul is saying through your faithfulness, I have seen proof of your salvation. And then he also says in verse 7, we're going to skip 6 for now, we'll come back to it. He says at the end of verse 7, he says that they have, the Philippian church has also taken place in his imprisonment or shared in his imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. What we can assume from this is that Paul is saying, not only have I seen you be faithful in the advancement of the kingdom, I have seen some of you jailed as I have been jailed for the gospel. I have seen some of you defend the gospel with your lives, and I have seen the gospel confirmed in your life because I knew you before Jesus, and now I know you after Jesus, and I see how you have been transformed. There are a number of times in the gospel or in the, in the New Testament where Paul has to defend his ministry. A number of times, one is the various because false teachers are slandering him and in other times because churches are legitimately afraid of Paul because if we forget, Paul was a murderer and his job was rounding up Christians and killing them. So they had a reasonable fear of Paul. But what would Paul do? He would say, that's not who I am anymore. That's who I was, but Christ has changed me. Look at who I am now. And so this is all to say Paul is just observing the Philippians church and he sees the fruit that their lives are bearing and he can have confidence in their salvation. So what we can do with this for us is that we can look inward and look at ourselves and say, am I faithful? 
Am I pursuing the things of God? Am I defending the things of God? We live in America, so we're not likely to be jailed, at least not now. So, but we can also ask, like, am I a different person? Have I been changed? And maybe some of us, when we're examining that aspect of our lives, we can tend to say, oh, man, I'm stuck. I'm not pursuing the things of God the way I'm supposed to. If I'm not demonstrating fruit, does that not mean that I'm not saved? Well, if Paul just stopped here, then absolutely that's what it means. But Paul doesn't stop here. Because more than human assurance, we have divine assurance of our salvation. Let's look at what Paul says in verse 6. Paul says this. He says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, this is so important because this all hinges on who is the he that Paul is speaking about. Now, we know exactly who he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who has never failed and the one who will never disappoint. And this is so important because humans fail. Humans mess up. Let's just take a quick look throughout the Bible. Did you know that over 300 times between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22, God's love is defined as steadfast? Steadfast which is what we could translate into faithful, never-ending, never-changing, never-increasing, never-decreasing. So over 300 times, we are reminded of the steadfast, unchanging, unmovable love of Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit for his people. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty reassuring, I think. But not only that... We have a number of times where we see people of God mess up. This is, uh, y'all, y'all are my guinea pigs. I got I to gotta, I gotta come clean with y'all. So I am preaching a youth retreat in October. This is the first message of that retreat. So y'all are my, y'all are my focus group. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to move from this and we're going to move into the life of Peter And if I can tell y'all what, I am so thankful that Peter is in the Bible because Peter's a screw up. And if if Paul was the only example that we had, I would just, I would want to just go stick my head in the sand somewhere. But we have Peter to look at. Peter, he gets out of the boat, he gets on the water and he runs to Jesus, but he takes his eyes off of him. And a lot of times we're like, wow, Peter had the courage, he had the faith to get out of the boat. But what does Jesus say to him? Ye of little faith. Peter doubts. He messes up. And then, just a couple chapters later, Jesus is beginning to explain to the disciples that he's going to have to go to the cross. And what what does Peter do? He says, no, 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 no. You're not going to do this. And Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter messes up again. He thinks he knows better than God. And then, if that were not enough, on the night before the crucifixion, Peter denies Christ three times. Says, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know that guy. I'm not with him. Just leave me alone. And we might say by human standards, all right, Peter, that's three strikes. You're done. You, you, you messed up. You're out. I'm going to find a different guy. And, you, you know, we had fun while you were here, but you got to go. But no, that's not. God is still faithful to Peter. Because if you remember After the resurrection, they eat breakfast. And this is so cool. The Bible says they ate breakfast by a charcoal fire. And there's only one other time that a charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament. And that was the same fire that Peter was warming himself by when he denied Christ. So at the sight of Peter's greatest failure... 
Christ comes and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. So we can see that even in the midst of our mistakes and our failures and our mess ups, that it is not dependent solely on ourselves, but it is solely dependent on he who began the work in us. If God started the work, he will finish the work. And we can hold on to that no matter how stuck we feel, how sinking we feel we are, how gross we may feel because we've just sinned again. We can always come back and say, it is God who has me. There's a story of a father who's talking to his son who is struggling with the assurance of his faith. And he goes to his son and he picks him up and he turns him upside down and he's holding him by his ankle. He's kind of doing a little, little drop game kind of thing, making him feel like he's falling. He says to his son, he says, are you falling? He says, no. Does it feel like you're falling? Yeah. What are you doing to keep yourself from falling? Now he's hanging upside down. Dad's got him by his ankle. He said, I'm doing nothing to keep myself from falling because it's his dad who's got him by the ankles. He's holding him. And it may feel that we are in a free fall into the abyss, but we know that if we are truly in Christ, then we will be held by him. Because Paul says, not only is it dependent on he who began the work, but he says in verse 7 that it is right for him to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers of with me of grace. He says, it's right for me to feel this way. It's right for me to be confident in your salvation because like me, I am saved by faith through, grace through faith. And you are saved by grace through faith. And all of these things, all of these human external evidences that Paul is so thankful for and that we should be demonstrating, he says, those are just fruit of a changed heart that is solely dependent on the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we see that Paul is thankful for the Philippians. He is confident in their salvation, not only because of the external human evidence, but because of the confidence that we can have in Christ. But he doesn't stop there because he then continues his prayer to move into the idea of sanctification. A lot of times we get we get stuck. And he says, well, I don't want you to get stuck. I want you to grow. And so he says, I'm thankful. I'm confident you're saved. And now I'm going to pray that you grow for glory. So let's move on into verse 8. Paul says this. He says, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Okay, so verse 9 is key here. This is what this section is going to hinge on. Paul is saying, as I'm praying that you will grow in love, it will abound more and more. So that's what he wants us to grow in. He wants us to abound in love. But this love is underpinned by two key concepts, with knowledge and all discernment. Okay, so our love should be growing, but it needs to be fueled by knowledge and discernment. So let's tackle each one of those individually. So what does it mean when Paul says that we need to be growing in knowledge? And sometimes we may be confused by this because we may think of 1 Corinthians 8, 1, where it says knowledge leads to being puffed up. Okay, so if why can Paul say in one place that knowledge is bad and in another place that knowledge is good? And that's where it, the context is key because there's two, excuse me, there's two different Greek words for knowledge. And one knowledge is one simply about knowing facts. And then there is another knowledge that Paul talks about here, and we also see him urge Titus is, I pray that you would grow in knowledge that leads to godliness. And so what he means is, is that as we grow in our understanding of God, that should prompt us, urge us, prod us to grow more and more God-like. Okay, so take this, take this for an example. You're getting, you, you, you get saved at a, at a, 
at, a, at an early age and you don't know the Bible very much, don't, very well, as most of us who got saved before the age of 10, you don't know the Bible incredibly well. So you get saved and you have now committed your life to following Christ. Well, as you learn about God, you're going to learn that there are things that he says that we should do and things that we shouldn't do. And anyone who has reared children knows that they are inherently deceptive. Children are very deceptive. Um, and so what they need to do, this is just an example for them, as they grow in knowledge through the discipleship of their parents and their, their, their church workers, they're going to learn that God does not desire his people to be deceitful. That is new knowledge that they have, they have just learned. It's like a light bulb. It's like, oh, God doesn't want me to lie. That's great. So now they have two options. They can either keep that knowledge and just that's a fact that they know, but they can continue to be deceitful, or they can let that knowledge fuel their say, say, okay, I choose to honor God. I have learned something new that should now drive me to be more obedient. And then we see that this fuels exactly what God says, what is love? Love is honoring God and obeying God and keeping his commandments. So how do we grow in our knowledge of God? Through the reading of God's word, the understanding of God's word, the listening to sound teaching, reading good books. There are so many ways that we can grow in the knowledge of God, and it needs to be a pursuit of our lives. Because the more we know about God, the better we can love God. So that's one thing, that knowledge of God will underpin our love. And then also, we need to grow in our discernment. Now, what is discernment? Discernment is simply knowing what is right and what is wrong. Now, this may seem a little overly simplistic, but the way that I teach it to my children and the youth and anyone who I get to teach it to, the way that we determine what is right and wrong is we run it through a lens and we ask two questions. Does what I'm about to do love God and love others? When we take the greatest commandment from, from Jesus, that's essentially what he says. He says we are to love God and to love others. And if we run every decision, every thought that we have, every action that we take through those two questions, it's pretty easy to tell what's right and what's wrong. And so what Paul is saying is, is that we need to grow in knowledge and discernment because that is what's going to lead us into verse 10 so that we may be able to approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. These are things that will grow our love ultimately for a life of obedience that will fill us, verse 11, with the fruit of righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Now, this is a difficult passage because we're trying to straddle a line here between human responsibility of obedience and the confidence that we can have in Christ's blood to save us. Because we can say, we separate these two things and we can say, no, it is only through my actions that I am saved. If I'm not in church and if I'm not obeying the commandments and I'm not reading the Bible, then it's evidence that I am not a believer. We can go that legalistic route. It's easy to fall into that ditch. And we can also go all the way over here and say, I am saved by grace through faith and where sin reigns, grace abounds all the more. So let me just stay where I'm at. And Christ will save me on that last day. That's the other ditch that we can fall into. So we have to do what is oftentimes the most difficult thing, and that's to find that middle ground of saying, I am saved by grace through faith, and there's nothing good in me. The only thing good in me comes through Jesus Christ. But I am going to make conscious, obedient decisions every single day to ensure that I am pursuing the things of God, that I am growing in my knowledge of him, that I am constantly trying to discern what is pure, what is holy, what is good, what is going to further the kingdom in my life. Because Paul says these things, two things work beautifully together and that we can have joy and thanksgiving when we recognize that I have been saved 
and now I am living a life, as Paul says, that is partnering in the gospel work from the first day until the last. So what do we do with this? How do we take this home with us? First off, if you are not a Christian, if you have never made the profession that Jesus is Lord of your life, today is the day. We are told that we are like the grass. We're here today and gone tomorrow. And if you are solely depending on your good works, there is no true assurance in that. The prophet Isaiah says that our best and most righteous actions are nothing but filthy rags before the Lord. If you need assurance of your salvation and you are not sure that you have professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't wait another day. Make today the day that you profess him as Lord and Savior of your life. Now, for those of us who have that confidence that we are saved, and you may be saying, you know what? I am stuck. I'm not pursuing the things of God. Take a page out of the Bible and say, well, if Paul prayed for growth, maybe I should pray for growth. Begin to pray for growth. Begin to pray for that motivation. Begin to pray for that faithfulness so that you may pursue the things of God. In just a moment, we're going to have a time where we can come and we can come down to the altar. I would encourage you that you would come and you would pray either individually or if you want someone to pray, you can come and grab me. But don't waste this opportunity. Too many times by this time, we're already thinking about where we're going to go to lunch. Don't let that be the case. Grab hold of the word of God and it's urging you to grow in love and knowledge and discernment so that we may live lives that bring glory and honor to the Father. So I invite you now to come, pray, seek the face of God.